Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you to optimal performance and healing and having the best life. Uh, today, I am super excited to interview the friend of another friend um, we just met, but I am absolutely passionate about the topic of biohacking and optimal human performance. My guest is uh, Brian, a health and human performance specialist with more than two decades of experience of innovating new protocols for research and for training coaches, Olympians, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, musicians, actors, high performance, and everyday people on the use of biological tools to achieve maximal output in training, performance, and recovery through understanding physiology. He's the author of Power, Speed, Endurance, co-author of Unplugged, the New York Times bestseller, Unbreakable Runner, and he created The Art of Breath, a principle-based approach to teaching the breathing's response to the body. Welcome, Brian, to the show. Thank you for having me, Jill. You're Appreciate welcome. I am so excited to dive into this when I saw your bio. And uh, again, we haven't met yet, but I'm going to get to know you today. And our mutual friend, Scott, said, you guys have got to meet. And I, when I read your bio, I thought, oh, this is going to be so much fun. So I love to start with your journey. How did you get into this field um, of human performance? Um, it was the only fit for me. <laughs> Every Nothing else worked. Well, it wasn't that nothing else worked. I wasn't enjoying much else uh i was in the restaurant industry I, I i my first job was probably around 16 um which i'm sure you were probably somewhere around there as well um you know uh and it wasn't until i was about 25 that i discovered um a class in exercise science that i ended up getting an a in and it was literally the first a i ever got in um the history of my academic career so so you knew there was something uh, going on there huh <laughs> well, i was like oh <laughs> this is interesting um I, I, it sounds like i care about this so i'll go with this and i ran with it um anyway i i ended up being mentored by a number of different people and working with a number of different people and I'm somebody who questions things, has a lot of questions and questions things. Uh, but my the route I really go, even though education kind of was the pinging moment, um, I, I do not I do not take the academic route first. That comes second. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I end up immersing myself in the subject I'm in, passionate about, doing it, participating in it then going into the kind of academic side of stuff. So at any rate, um, I got started uh, in by really coaching runners, um, namely the housewives of New Newport Beach, who made me uh, cash rich uh, okay. because I was fixing them. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were all pretty broken and running. And I was the kind of guru in the running department. And I was utilizing strength and conditioning. My background started very early around human movement. Uh -huh. uh, and I was very successful for the first decade or so of my career. Um, and then I stumbled into this breathing thing um, where I kind of, it really made me think about what I had been doing from a movement standpoint. Um, and I ran with that in an obsessive way, um, by immersing myself into it. And then I went into the kind of academic side of things where I started understanding the respiratory physiology, the neurobiology of how breathing, the respiration centers are set up, how the brain operates with things. Um, you know, I just dove in, um, and then I found myself on an Island really, because I was applying this to, um, human performance. I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't, I, I had taken yoga and I love yoga, but I wasn't applying it to yoga because yoga had that figured out 5,000 years ago. Um, and so I was really interested in how does this apply with the upper tier of what people are doing, whether that be an operator, a football player, or an endurance athlete. Um, and so I started measuring things on metabolic carts etc. 
And I was seeing changes and I'm seeing changes today that uh, are unheard of or unseen really inside the human performance world. Um, but they just require a little bit of uh, mental change about how I'm actually approaching something. Wow. So I love that. So at the core is so many of my guests. There's this principle here that I already heard and it's curiosity. Correct. Right. And curiosity is a mark of genius. So there's like a very direct connection because what it takes that curiosity to say, well, what else is possible? Well, what if, right? It's those questions we ask. And then we start to see a pattern that maybe no one else has seen. And they say, well, let's try this. And I can see that in your history. So I'm curious. Yeah. Start out with the housewives and they were running and injuring themselves. What in that process did you learn? What was common injuries and how did that lead you to the breath work? Let's tie that together. And then I want to go into the breathing. Like, was there a common thing that they were doing wrong or, or not thinking? Yeah, I mean, mo mo most people don't think most people approach running by going out and just running. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately with our current lifestyles, that's not the best approach that I've found. Um, some people can get away with it. Um, especially if you start young with running. Um, in fact, kids really under the age of five run perfectly until we mess them up. We put them in shoes that yeah. promote more heel striking, things that wouldn't naturally take place had they not had that buffer mechanism, right? Yeah. Um, but sit, the amount of sitting we do changes the hip, the, the, mm -hmm. the structure, the spine, all of it. Um, so we compensate. I mean, mo most of what I saw very early on were... Um, you know, it, it was lower body injury type stuff, but people were not, um, they, they just weren't recovering real well from things. And so that's where kind of the strength and conditioning kind of came in with the, with the movement stuff and the endurance stuff. So I had, I was coming at this, I mean, my first book was that, that's what it was about. It was about, it was a skill-based approach to endurance training where I utilize strength and conditioning to help build the tissue and, and get the mechanical stuff we wanted to see with people with like getting them better posterior chain function. Yes. Cause we have an anterior chain dominant species, no matter, it doesn't even matter if we're sitting all day, it's right. how it is. Um, and so developing those sorts of things allowed people to start seeing results they didn't believe that they, they didn't think it wasn't even in their scope right yeah. and they're like, oh my god i feel so good i'm running fast like like it's just it's wild what's going on anyway it, it, it just that really took off but it, you know at the foundation of that is really what's going on with what we would call quote unquote the core um and if the what i figured out was that, you know, my, my epiphanal, my epiphany, the big moment for breathing was somebody handed me a resistance breathing device. And I laughed at it because it said elevation training mask. I've, I've, I've studied and applied high altitude, low oxygen training for 20 something years at this point. And, and 12 or so years or 10 years into my career, somebody's handing me something that has no app, no way of changing oxygen or pressure, meaning bear like the pressure of the air, right? <laughs> so it doesn't affect the gradient change in, in the lungs. I'm like, there's no way this does anything for elevation. I, so I laughed at it, but I knew that I hadn't tried it. And my whole MO is like, you know, we'll do it first, then see. And so I put it on. And when I drew a breath, I, I sat up and organized myself. Wow. From from and I'm just was just sitting kind of yeah. like this, but I organized a little bit differently. And I was like, holy crap. Wow. That, like, wait a second. If I were to give this to my athletes to use in warm-ups or some conditioning stuff just to do, they're gonna organize them. The diaphragm is the epicenter of human movement. And then I, that's when I started really looking into the physiology of stuff. And even physiology tells this story is like, there's this phenomenon called blood stealing, which is the metaboriflex of, of basically how the lungs operate. And if the diaphragm and intercostals are not operating correctly, you are going to draw blood from locomotor muscles earlier when moving, so as intensity increases, to shunt it towards those muscles. So the muscles you want to work aren't actually able, so you're more anaerobic sooner, you're using different energy systems sooner, you're changing these things. And so 
as my as the evolution of what I was looking at started to evolve. And this was like this happened over a month where I really like was like, oh my gosh, like everything's changed. My my rib cage expanded, my breathing changed, the way I was training changed. Um, I just invested in understanding, like changing how I was breathing and really adapting to things. At any rate, it 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 was this curiosity that drove me to get into this obsession and then i was just seeing result after result after result after and i'm like oh my and so i my first thing to do after i'm seeing results is i toss it out to the coaches i work with yeah. the people that are in a direct circle screw around with this start playing with this they start doing it it starts out then i talk about it publicly and then people start screwing around and then it's like okay now we're here. <laughs> yeah, here, we're here here we're here and now i'm being you know i'm being contracted yeah. by stanford I'm, be, I'm being like contracted by other people like hey can you help me understand this what's going like how, could we apply this in, in this setting you know this anyway so um it, it inevitably like what what the big outcome of this is is that We've figured out, I've figured out largely how to apply this in real time to, let's say it, quote unquote, exercise. And it's become fundamentally a fa the foundation to how we train because breathing is such, is the first respondent really to change as we exercise. Like as you, like as we increase intensity going from, sitting to walking respiration rate changes right as you know <laughs> and, and this happens largely due to co2 okay there are other factors that exist but right the gradient of everything in the body is driven by the level of co2 correct and if you are over breathing which is where we saw the big the, yes the big thing was that even world champions I was working with were over breathing. Which drives down CO2, which then they lose that drive to get oxygen transfer into the cells, right? Correct. So yeah. so we now change the dissociation effect of things. And and this is we're 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 explaining a basic thing that is a very complex phenomenon that so is ends this up like a fancy paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, well, it was, it's funny because like some of the stuff I, when I go speak, it's like, you remember what people used to do when they tell you to calm down? Yeah. They tell you to breathe into a bag. Right. Right. Why? Because CO2, because the vasodilates, it calms you down. Like you're actually getting more oxygen. You're not going to run out of oxygen right. for a while. Uh, at any rate. So it, it's, when I started to really understand the, the physiology behind this stuff, it was like, wow. And then you you've got the cascades of you know the endocrine system yeah. response to things you've got all of these things that are occurring and um but it really came down to um if you don't manage how you deal with stress mm -hmm. and you can exercise your life away if you want but if you do not confront the pain that bothers you yeah we've all got it there's no amount of breathing. There's no amount of exercise that can help you. However, I know where to insert the breathing in that process of dealing with pain yeah. based on all of this stuff at this point, because I've, I've gotten into the weeds enough to really see, oh, here's where the intervention happens. Here's how it happens and when. Wow. My mind is blown because it's so exciting when there's something that's so, so simple in a way. And so aligned with what we know about physiology. I mean, it's not like a, a you know, two hundred thousand um, dollar hyperbaric chamber, right? <laughs> this is really more. So, is this a mass device that you use? Is there? Oh no, no, no. no. This is you, 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 and you alone. So you're teaching people how to breathe differently. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. And uh, your, you know, your listeners. You just who, learned that the yeah, click was. You're going to walk away today with with uh, app, applicable tools to screw around with, awesome. um, you know, uh, but I mean, this is largely the basis of my work that, you know, I, I, I'm hired largely at this point, um, by private clients yeah. that want me to kind of restructure what's going on with inside their regimen. I don't necessarily take away things. I look at what they're doing and I go, oh, okay, here's where we need to insert breathing mm -hmm. or breath control. And then, you know, I mean, like I've got an NFL guy, I got one of the top guys in the NFL right now who is arguably quickly becoming the, he, he's 
writing real close to my top client, who's a CEO of multiple companies, but he's an NFLer who follows direction incredibly well, but is curious about it and wants to deal with it. And he's, he's having in, incredible results. Um, and this is a guy who's at the top of the food chain, like literally top yeah. of the food chain. Yeah. And it, you would think this guy has it all. And it's like, well, no, there's always something we right. can tweak if we're willing to look at it a little differently. And so I get hired to come in and kind of restructure things um, and run programs like, like that um, for people in order to adjust things based on all of this stuff. So I, I can, what we've really figured out how to do is kind of fingerprint breathing for somebody based on what, what one might call CO2 tolerance. But again, it's a com it's a, it's more complex complicated than that it's hey where's your nervous system at because if your nervous system's a little hot like your hrv is yep. low yep. i can tell you right now you're going to be a little co2 intolerant because your nervous system's running hot your chemoreceptors are going to legitimately yep. um respond sooner you're going to probably be over breathing a bit more so your hrv data is going to be hot like low and respiration rates probably going to be a little high but we can change that it's just are you willing to listen like, right so, so tell us, like, um, you obviously work with very high profile athletes for performance, so, but obviously people listening here, we've got a lot of doctors, professionals, but we also have a lot of patients. Where, where does your assessment start? Give us some kind yeah. of practical, like what, what could we do yeah. to know where we're at? If like, are we very yes. good? Yeah. So um, one of the things that's really taken off um, is what's called kind of the CO2 tolerance test. I call it an exhale assessment because it, it, so I, I stole it from the freediving community. They've been using it for years and, and for good reason. Their life's on the line. They want to understand where their actual breathing's at. It's simply an, a, a long controlled exhale, the longest, most controlled exhale you can manage off of a, a single breath, right? Um, on our website, we, we offer people a whole free assessment yeah. for this. So people can go to that, which is shiftadapt.com and then just go to take the breath assessment, or I think it's forward slash breath work. Yeah. Um, but they'll find it. If they just go to shiftadapt.com, they'll take the breath assessment and they just pop in their email and they'll get the whole instruction and then it'll kick out um, some protocols. But the most effective way to do this is to take this assessment, go through the process of like, it calming down for a minute, like for a couple minutes, and then you inhale all the way up. And then you'll start a stopwatch the moment you hit the top of a breath. And then you're going to exhale as slowly as you possibly can through your nose. You want to think I'm going to exhale for two minutes. Mm -hmm. You won't, but you'll try yeah. and you time it. Do it a few times the first time you do it. Now do that every day for five to seven days to get a statistic on that. What is the average number? What am I putting out like with this? That number multiplied by 0.7, I believe is the number. And that'll give you kind of a starting breath to start with that'll help build some things in terms of if I were to do box breathing, mm -hmm. So if I, so if I went 30 seconds and I'll just run, run you through this real quick. So let's just say I exhaled for 30 seconds and I multiply that by 0.7. Mm -hmm. I've got 21. So I would divide that by three. That gives me seven. So if I did box breathing, we'd want you to do seven, 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 seven to see if you could handle something like that. Mm -hmm. Now they just go to shift adapt.com. Yeah. They'll get a protocol that actually fits with their profile. Cause I go into this a little bit deeper by doing, mm -hmm. I use what's called the DOS questionnaire, the depression, anxiety, stress um, assessment. So I can see, so I've been able to see that certain profiles, depending on where we lean, how they respond to certain breathing protocols, whether it's holding the breath on an in, holding it on an exhale, long exhale, short exhale, whatever. Anyway, we apply a lot of these principles into the breathing so that we can actually fingerprint somebody on, on a protocol, but it's best to 
take the, those numbers and apply them to um, being able to follow a breathing protocol that works for you based on that exhale assessment, because that exhale assessment is giving you a, a, a number that is where your tolerance is at. Got it. it it's similar to a breath hold. Mm -hmm. However, the problem with the breath hold is that that can be manipulated in terms of, I don't need mechanics for that. Yes. So I can go and hold my breath and I don't mechanically need to do yes. anything. If I'm exhaling through my nose, I actually need eccentric control and glottal control to handle that air. So I'm getting more of a mechanical intervention. And then I'm seeing physiologically how I'm responding to this, the stressor of CO2 build from such yes. a slow exhale. And then we also can get kind of, if I'm with the person, I can ask them how they felt about it. And that'll kind of give more of the psychological profile of things. We've all got a panic switch. It's what happens during that panic, what you go through. So um, fascinating so yeah. i'm wondering if divers swimmers pilots are there subsets of people that already know some of this and do it naturally because of their occupation or their i don't i'm just guessing i have no idea yes. if are, but yeah you'll have certain you'll you'll have certain group like look the nfl -er, mm -hmm. he he scored in a, a very normal category however he had anomalies on a VO2 max huh? assessment and a pulmonary assessment. Yeah. So I went in, ran in my own pulmonary assessment and metabolic assessment on him where I'm looking at tidal volume, ventilation, yeah. respiration rate. Um, and then I'm also, what I'm also doing is looking at tissue uh, O2 saturation. So I'm watching it delivery and saturate mm -hmm. all of this. So I'm able to absolutely pinpoint things. And so we found a bit of an anomaly with him and it, it would it wouldn't nobody else would really ever pick this up yeah. uh, because they're just not doing what I'm doing. I, not that I'm special. It's just what I'm doing is Better. so yeah, it's so you know specialized that like mm -hmm. that's what we do. Like and what I've seen is pretty ridiculous um, in terms. I mean, mo but with with lead athletes that I get a hold of, I see a twenty percent increase in, in VO two max. Oh. That's unbelievable. That, 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 <laughs> yeah. Now, we probably won't see that number with, we don't see that number with everybody, but with general population, uh -huh. I'm seeing between 20 and 60% changes in VO2 max. Wow. Which is really unheard and of. And bigger because the elite athletes have already honed this in so well that you're taking that next little sliver, but the average person might be so poorly using, um, their facilities that they, they have a much well, bigger, right? It's largely a mechanical thing. Okay. Most, most people, including lead athletes, mm -hmm. even though they're strong, they've been breathing fairly normally, like really, um, when you train the primary breathing muscles, the way that we are applying things, you're training them like uh, a power lifter or like a would train to yeah. squat right? You're training those muscles in a way that you've never trained them right. through what we've developed with, through what's called the, the breathing gear system. Got it. And that begins with really understanding how to breathe through your nose when you exercise. And that most of what you're doing in exercise should be breathing through your nose and right. not your mouth. So if you have someone who average, again, my patient population might be a, you know, 55 year old menopausal woman who wants to start a training program, obviously anyone can benefit here, but Correct. is you, you started out in conditioning and strength and some of the body um, mechanics, does that tie into here? Can they do the breathing without knowing how to move their body and have that Correct. anterior? Yes. Everybody uh, that I work with the buy-in for re like heavy training, yeah. you've got to do a minimum of 45 minutes of walking per day with your mouth shut. So that means you're not talking on your phone and you're not talking to your friends for 45 minutes. The bonus is 90 minutes, like mm -hmm. get 90 minutes in. This is your five, this is your 10,000 steps per day. However, it's now 10,000 steps per day by design, meaning how we were designed to actually move, right? And breathe. Mm -hmm. You're now using a what we would call what I call a, a gear one 
which is nose bridge. And anybody can really do this. They just may need to go slower at first. Mm -hmm. But this will also help develop help develop that that nervous system and your CO2 tolerance because it's low level work that you're actually starting to use the full tidal volume with because you're right through the nose. You don't get as much mm -hmm. as you can through the mouth, right? So this has huge changes for people in pretty quickly. Like within two weeks, you start to see some pretty radical changes. It can then progress up to there for more elite athletes that uh, football players I'm not doing this with because they don't need this kind of work, but like the general population and a lot of other athletes, we, we hear about heart rate zone two. Mm -hmm. that it's really heart rate zone two is really this mythological place that nobody really, the vast majority of people have no idea what they're doing, even though they say they're doing heart rate zone two, they're doing cardiovascular training, not actual metabolic training per se if they don't know where there's where the physiological change is happening for heart rate zone two. So meaning I've got to change an upward change in lactate at the first change that happens where that heart rate meets at that moment. That's where that heart rate zone two is at. Right. Yes. So back out of there. Well, if lactate's going up, I know we're having a bit of a metabolic change. You know this as well. So I'm having a bit of a metabolic change. If that me there's a metabolic change happening, CO2 is rising, you're going to see a respiration rate change. We know this to be ventilation VT1. Mm -hmm. Well, it just so happens that I've basically anything beyond heart rate zone two should probably change into some very rapid nose breathing if you can handle it or mouth breathing. Everything below heart rate zone two is nose only. So developing your breathing up to that level is where you want to go. And then you want to kind of progress. So you can start to ramp that intensity from the walking into maybe a little bit of jogging for a period of time. And you may need to walk between efforts, but keeping the nose and going at a low effort to start or just doing some drills with even some high intensity you don't see 100 meter sprinters breathing through their mouths much at mm -hmm. all until after the event. Um, so you can get away with stuff for some time, but it's really retraining this breathing through the nose up to a certain intensity, then starting to introduce mouth breathing. But you do not want to start doing that if this is new yeah. until you're about three or four weeks in because that diversion happens pretty quickly and you start to default into the secondary. So I'm showing the neck, mu yes. you'll, you'll, start right. you'll start engaging a lot of the neck muscles and a lot of the things that tie into trying to pull that rib cage mm -hmm. open even more. Yeah. And unfortunately that's what most of us are doing because of the lifestyle that we're living already. Yeah. So do we, oh, I have so many questions. First of all, for those non-exercise physiologists, define heart rate zone too. Is that like up to 130 or? Um, it, well, it, 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 it all differentiates. Yeah, got it. it it's literally, it, it's like 60%. Got it. 60%. Got it. So it's 70% and below of your max okay. heart rate, roughly. Got it. Just to be clear, if you're following heart rate for that, yeah. you're, you're training heart rate. You're not training metabolically, although your metabolism is involved in this. Yes. You do not know unless you're drawing lactate and or you're very clued into your breathing that you're transitioning. And most people who just so a lot of your client, a lot of your patient, yeah. a lot of your client population, their heart rate zone two is going to be way below 70% of max heart rate, way below. Because that shift in energy is going to happen a lot sooner. And they'll know based on their breathing. Once this gets really difficult to breathe through the nose when they're exercising, you're crossing that line. And you're saying if we could measure lactic acidosis, that's the driver. That is the thing, not heart rate. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Totally correct. That, well, that's what they do. Is they, yeah. they, they literally, or we use on a metabolic. We rate. had. And yeah, we, the sensors and things, right? Ventilation, yep. VT1 and VT2. But 
if you really want to be accurate, you draw a lactate, which yes. you get a $300 monitor and draw a lactate and see where the upward curve and in intensity happens. Got but it. you got to know how to do that test in and of itself. Yes. Um, and you, th that is the definitive point. You'll see that when you hit that point, oh, my breathing's also changing at this point. Well, yeah, now it makes sense. This Got it. Okay. So hard. you're saying the way we know versus a number is going to be, it's going to be really freaking hard to get breath, enough breath out of the nose because you're trying to compensate from that lactic acid. Right. So if your heart rate zone too, let's just say mm -hmm. you, you were told it's 130 or that's what the app says, right? It's 130. But your you can only nose breathe to 115 mm -hmm. heart rate. You're I'm betting I would put a lot of money on the fact from what I've seen yeah. that your lactate, your that your the heart rate zone two is at yeah. 115. Yeah. That makes so much sense to me. I actually love this because so often we're on the heart rate, the garments, the monitors, and those are nice. Those are great thing with heart rate variability. But if we could just really teach people what just sounds like you do, I do the same thing to get in touch with their bodies. There might be actually more clues with their pure physiology than a number, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. They are having an intimate relationship with their physiology. Like yeah. it, quite literally, you're, you're yeah. learning how your physiology works. You're going back to what many of our ancestors knew intuitively. Mm -hmm. So ironically, just personally, and I think this will be relevant to listeners, I just started working with a trainer and started running and I haven't run for years. Um, yeah. Just, we won't go into reasons why, but just today I went on my first run and I want to say, okay, so someone like me who's starting off again after years of not running, um, it sounds like what you're saying is this, when you reach that threshold, either you keep breathing out of your nose or you take these breaks and you do a slow down, you bring that back into the range where you can breathe out of your nose. So I might be running 20, 30, 40% versus hundred or 80% and walking in between as I get to know my body until I can breathe out of my nose through the whole run. Is that true? I Correct. Yeah. Correct wreck like if you really want to make a huge impact i would apply this yeah this this fundamental to the running and when you cross that line and it, it'll happen it happens because running is a big cost right um it'll catch up and when you feel that transition happen cut it yeah for a moment and then repeat and then what you'll cool. see over a, i would say a, a few weeks is that change and yeah. you'll see your ability to run with with your mouth shut fairly yeah. easy. now not all running is mouth shut yeah. it, and we've i've run into this problem as well um early on we thought it was very, like all almost all mm -hmm. amazing no when I finally had enough data and I could see metabolically that there were crossover points that were happening. So you get the opposite effect of what's happening with overbreathing. Yeah. You're getting under breathing. So mm -hmm. now when you actually do need to onboard more oxygen, right. When you've got a higher intensity because you've got hydrogen in the system, there's plenty of lactate. You mm -hmm. oxygen becomes a buffer at that point. Yeah. So that you can actually buffer the system and you're not as acidic. Um, so it, just one of the things, however, this allows you to transition into more of the mouth breathing, which is where the gear system really comes in is it's it. five gears. And I, I saw a number of people who would do, we do metabolic assessments and then they'd be nose breathing to like two minutes until they, they, they shut it down. Uh -huh. They couldn't, they, they couldn't maintain a fast enough breathing pace with their mouth. So yeah. they, they'd only get to 30, 35 breaths a minute before they were just toast. And you should be able to easily get over 40 breaths a minute while going hard. Um, and, you know, if you're trained in, in some capacity, right? So at any rate, we, we started to see this issue. At any rate, that's where the gear four, gear five start to come in. And, you know, we start to play with that stuff. But that because you're you're training the primary breathing muscles with the nose breathing mm -hmm. you're going to maintain a lot of that when you get into the higher intensity stuff versus the the yes. 
the secondary muscles taking over sooner. And mm -hmm. so we're staving off blood stealing to a later stage. It, it's a horrible, right. time, but it, it, this is what happens. I mean, this is one of the anomalies we saw within our NFL -er, is he was, um, he, the blood, we could see the blood stealing happen, but it was the opposite of what was going on. He was doing 60 breaths per minute. Um, and yet his tidal volume wasn't anywhere near what it was. Yeah. Like, so it, I was like, Oh, like he, he's literally got less tidal volume and he's compensating. So he's by rate. Yeah. By rate. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, boom. And so that, that, that was kind of the catch of what we, yeah. we, were, we were able to see. This reminds me because I'm not as up on my pulmonary physiology, but cardiac output, obviously stroke volume times heart rate. And so we compensate as the stroke volume decreases. I see that a lot because I'm dealing with a lot of POTS dysautonomia where their stroke volume is not yes. actually having decreased volume and depletion. And so then all of a sudden they get tachycardic, they get POTS dysautonomia, drop in blood pressure. So I'm actually okay. dealing with this on that level. Oh, okay. So here, you're going to love this. All okay. right. I'm so glad you just brought that up. <laughs> so heart the heart beats fullest between 40 and 60% of VO2 max. Uh -huh. From there, the heart only beats faster and it does not beat full. Right. So, You're losing so, stroke volume, right? Correct. Yeah. So watch this. So here's where this is beautiful and what, what we've already covered and what you're going to love. That is largely walking pace for a lot of people. Wow. Where they lose that stroke volume, literally walk. They lose it. So if we've got them nasal breathing, nose breathing, full lungs, yeah. off that aortic arch, you're now diffusing. Every, it's all working a chunk. You're remodeling the heart. You're doing all the things you want to do that with all of these patients you've just Okay, this is such an awesome aha. It was worth the whole podcast because what you're saying, and just let me to correct me if I'm wrong. Is yeah. by keeping that nose breathing, doing the starting with the 90 minutes or 60 minutes of just breathing with their nose, doing the walk, yeah. they will actually increase their heart's ability to have a, a stroke volume at the same level of activity. And in turn, they could probably decrease their POTS dysautonomia over time as well. I, I'm not guaranteeing that. I'm right. just saying, here's what yeah, I logically it makes sense, right? <laughs> here's what I understand about physiology. The heart beats fullest between 40 and 60%. Got it. Obviously, the fitter you are, <laughs> the, 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 like, even the, the fitter you are, the actually lower that rate gets, right? Mm -hmm. So, but most people who haven't been engaged in something like this, that is where that place exists is, like, if I were to put anyone, I put anybody on a metabolic car, I get them walking, they're going to be at 40% pretty quickly. Yes. OK, so it's somewhere in that range where we're getting that. So if I'm constantly for focusing on below heart rate zone two with people and namely walking is deal like I've the, the changes I've seen with my client base and close compadres who I bounce things off of are wild. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've got guys, I got a buddy of mine who is one of the most famous ultra marathon runners wrote. He, he's the wrote a book, number one bestseller on everything back in 2006 he's been ultra running for 30 years and he he applied this a couple of years ago six months into it he calls me up and he goes mckenzie dude <laughs> I, my vo2 max has increased 20 percent wow how in god's name did that happen uh -huh. and i'm like dude you, you, you just retrained your breathing muscles. You, you have like, you're so used to doing everything the way you've always been doing them. So you've just built that. And I'm, you know, I mean, I've seen women change their rib cages from like 32 inches to 36 inches. Oh, amazing. And then the other thing I'm curious about is obviously our diaphragm is the driver here. We shouldn't be using accessory, but is there a never use accessory or is it just only at those? Like, tell us about what. Yeah, accessories really only come on at yeah. uh, once we cross moderate levels Got it. of exercise. It really, it's not, I mean, sure, you can have a, yeah. like, but, but <laughs> we trained like, everything changes. So it's, it's actually, it's not just the diaphragm. It is the intercostals and diaphragm. So uh, that's part of the work that I really like. It was all this talk on diaphragmatic breathing and, you know, it's a great thing to say. However, it's not factual. 
Yeah. You There's can't, so much more. <laughs> it's so much more. And your inner cost, like it's about your rib cage. Got it. Rib cage not is not just moving with that diaphragm. And everybody's diaphragm actually works. Okay. Everybody's using their diaphragm. It's just how sticky or glued down or tight it actually is. And once we start engaging in this process, it starts to open things up and everything expands. Wow. The bigger the cage, the bigger the VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Got it. Amazing. And so VO2 max, obviously, there's a little bit more um, availability of machines and things that are more portable. But is that something you recommend for someone who... I mean, I'm maybe not our average patient kind of person, but someone who really wants to optimize, should we be everybody knowing the VO2 max? Yeah, I, I think it's a very good thing to get tested at least once a year. Um, most people will never do that. They'll probably do it like once a decade or once every five years yeah. if they go to their car cardiologist who runs a stress test on them. There's so many people that are doing things like this and you can go to a university too that'll make, that might even do it for free. Um, but a VO2, knowing your VO2 max is, is, is a really good thing. Just getting that number, if it's high enough, yeah. you don't really need to worry about it, especially if you're engaged in stuff like this. Gotcha. I mean, I test myself every uh, probably th less than three months, but I have the equipment and yeah. I'm constantly looking at this stuff. And at 50 years old, I still have a 65 VO2 max. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, like I... The, the folks I work with all have very high VO2 maxes and it's not, it's, it's not a, like, it's not this, oh, you're, you're predisposed. This is just where you're at. No, it's, we're, I think we're a bit more capable than we've given ourselves credit for. We're just not using the things that were there, you know, that have always been there in the way they have. This is so fascinating and I've learned so much. And maybe in the last few minutes, I would love to know you've got all these high performers athletes, but my average audience is like, well, that's not me, right? Do you have any stories or just a, a scenarios of where you've helped just the average everyday kind of person make a massive transformation? through? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And most of my clients are the, your average kind of, uh, you know, um, executives. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, and they're not very fit sometimes. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no. Uh, um, you know, I mean, look, it took, I, I got a client right now who he's one of my favorite people, but it took him probably four or six months to get him to the baseline of walking every day, 45 wow. minutes. Like that's how long we worked together before we actually engaged wow. in the, uh, because he just didn't want to fit it in. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's like, he had all these excuses fitting it uh -huh. in. I'm like, you keep doing this. It's perfectly fine with me, but you're paying me, paying a, lot me but... <laughs> a lot of money to sit here and get you walking. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Anyway, rate, um, you know, it, all of this applies to anybody and everybody. If it works for, this is the beauty yeah. of, of what human performance is. If it works for an elite athlete, it works even more or us, or the general population. And the fact is, is that if you have kids, you're working, you are actually more of an elite athlete than, than an elite athlete. An elite athlete does not have a job outside of the training. The training is the job. Right. They get time off between training, they're eating, they have massage therapists, they have all the recovery stuff set up. They're like, they're being paid to do this stuff. They're going to bed at a time that nobody else is screwing around with, right? Like, they got everything. We have this whole thing we're trying to juggle, right? Well, the moment you get over the self-abandonment crap and start going, no, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take care of myself first. And this is literally the, like the number one thing I start with when I go and speak is here's the foundation of it all. And it's a slide that just says boundaries. Yeah. You need boundaries to tell everybody else I'm dealing with me first. My top client who's a, who owns multiple companies, okay? He affects everybody who I talk to, including on this podcast. Everybody's affected by him, by what he runs and does, right. okay? He is up at 4.30 in the morning and takes care of all of his training and stuff prior to him engaging and going to work, no matter where he is in the world. He's on a plane Thursday, he'll be in Paris, I'll adjust things for his training to happen so that he's that right. Then he's in Scotland and then he's somewhere else and then he's home. And it, it, it's, Hey, he's doing this every time because he's set these boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
everybody's capable of this. It's just not letting your emotional kind of system overrun the excuse side of things and letting the, 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 the more realistic side of things like the, the thinking part going, Oh, I really do want to do this. Like, this is what I want to be doing. Okay. So you got to say no. Love it. Other thing. Yeah. This is, this is why I have this. <laughs> Uh, one, of my, one, of, one of my colleagues gave me gave me this shirt he's literally like you need to start learning how to say no <laughs> literally i was running around saying yes to everything right. and everybody and it was dry like it really screwed me up yeah but when we start to set these boundaries and start to take time you don't have to get up at 4 30 in the morning to do this but get up and go move yeah go for a walk even if it's 15 minutes break that up four or five times a day do it do it repetitively, R make a routine, get consistent, do that. Build this over a few weeks. What happens? Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you feel worse. I have yet to have anybody tell me that that has happened. So at any rate, it really does apply to everybody to set these boundaries and take care of themselves um, so that they can actually live the lives they want to be living right, and not have to make excuses for it. Wow. Love it. And what I love the most is granted the higher levels, there's a lot more details and uh, assessment, but yes. the specific that you just gave us are, are accessible to anyone. So sure. tell people where they can find you again, where they can go to get this information yeah. from your website. And yeah. So they can go to shiftadapt.com. That's our website. And my, my partner and I, Emily Hightower, she does more of the uh, kind of somatic trauma work around breath work. She does really cool stuff with that. Um, I'm more in the, Hey, what are you, how are you taking care of yourself? Like, okay, we need to get you walking. Then we need to start develop a program on that side of things. We also have a membership side to what we do. That's a very easy cost thing for people who don't, who can't afford us privately. Right. And that implements all of this stuff. However, that breath assessment is on there. They can get breathing protocols based on that. They can also start walking and then start increasing things on how we've talked. And I can guarantee they will begin to not only remodel the heart, but remodel how they're functioning metabolically, which changes the entire game. Like there is, it's not even a biohack. This is like, this is how you were designed to operate. And it's, i Walking changed how I trained. Wow. I do it, like I, I, I walk 90 minutes every day minimum. Amazing. Oh, I love this because I love it. So practical, so applicable. And even in my sickest patients can start somewhere. So it's. Yeah. And, and, if, and if walking is a problem, mm -hmm. get on a bike or a stationary bike. Same effort. Perfect. Pedal. Perfect. Pedal. Shut your mouth and just pedal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Brian, thank you for your brilliance, your curiosity decades ago when the start with, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, wherever you started. Um, absolutely amazing. I love the work you're doing. Love sharing this with the audience. And thanks for taking time to come on today. Thank you, Jill. Appreciate it.